Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Rising violence against Hindus in Bangladesh spurs international concern. Pakistan disrupting peace in Jammu and Kashmir by sponsoring terrorism. And Taliban's third year in power marks unprecedented oppression of Afghan women. Violence and chaos have engulfed Bangladesh, where protests against the controversial government job quota system have spiralled into a full-blown crisis. The Hindu minority is bearing the brunt of this unrest, facing brutal attacks, looting and destruction across the country. Despite assurances from the interim government, fear and uncertainty grip the community as targeted violence spread across 45 districts. With the international community raising alarms, the situation in Bangladesh is becoming a critical human rights issue, threatening the nation's secular identity. Our report will tell you more. In Bangladesh, what began as a protest against the controversial quota system for government jobs has escalated into widespread violence and chaos. The minority Hindu community has found itself at the center of this unrest, facing severe attacks, looting and destruction of property. Recently, the streets of Dhaka were flooded with thousands of Hindu demonstrators voicing their anger and fear after a series of coordinated attacks on their community across Bangladesh. Holding placards and displaying photographs of vandalized homes and temples, the protesters demanded action and protection. Despite repeated assurances from the interim government led by Muhammad Yunus, many Hindus in Bangladesh say they no longer feel safe. The violence has spread across 45 of Bangladesh's 64 districts with Hindu homes businesses and places of worship being systematically targeted. Dozens of Bangladeshi Hindus were injured in these brutal attacks. हम लोग शुरू से 1971 के बाद जब भी कोई सरकार गिरती है बा चेंज होता है सबसे पहले हमारे ऊपर आक्रमण होता है हम ही सब रोशन का हिस्सा है सकल राजनीतिक जो दल है सब हमारे ऊपर रोष है हम तो यहाँ संघ का लोग है आप लोग जानते हैं हम माइनॉरिटीज है हमारे ऊपर ये आक्रमण का तो हमने हम नहीं बुझ समझ पाते जो हमारे साथ ये सब क्यों होता है सब कहते हैं कि हम आपके साथ है हम आपके साथ है लेकिन आज तक किसी भी कोई भी क्राइम का विचार नहीं हुआ अभी तक हम किसी भी क्राइम का मंदिर जलता है गिरजा जलता है हिंदू माइनॉरिटी देर जो दुकान पाठ है बारीगर है यहाँ तक कि लड़की को भी अगवा कर लेता है लेकिन इन सब का कोई the situation has grown increasingly dire with reports of Hindu temples being vandalized and at least two Hindu leaders from Sheikh Hasina's Awami League party being killed. In a desperate attempt to escape the violence, nearly 800 Bangladeshi Hindus tried to cross the border into India last week. However, India's border security force turned them back, closely monitoring the escalating situation. The unrest has sparked international concern with the global Hindu community rallying in support. 
Demonstrations have been held across the United States, United Kingdom, Canada and India, demanding immediate intervention and an end to the persecution. I'm here today in front of White House to ask our elected officials, Foreign Relations Committee, to ask the interim government uh, president, Dr. Yunus, to immediately, immediately stop or bring justice to the, all the minorities. We need protection. We need immediate protection. We need safety for all the religious minorities, not only Hindus. Hindus are targeted, driven out of their homes long, for a long, long time. This is not the first time. It's almost enough time to say, after 1975 years, when Jinnah said he cannot live with Hindus, I would like to say now, we cannot live with Muslim anymore. We need uh, something else. We need a solution. We are gathered here because in Bangladesh, uh, for the last couple of five, six days, people are torturing, burning our houses. Hindus, uh, Christians, minorities' houses are burned. Our brothers have been killed. Our mothers have been killed. They are looting our houses. They are burning our houses, our churches, our temples. We want justice for Bangladesh. We are, we are citizens of Bangladesh and we want to stay in Bangladesh. They cannot take, this Islam is the fundamentalist, they cannot take our country and they cannot deport us from Bangladesh. We want justice as a Bangladesh, we want to stay in our country as a safe manner, we want peace and we want to stay. They need to stop the violence against the minorities in Hindus. Hindus constitute about 8% of Muslim majority Bangladesh's 170 million people and have historically largely supported Hasina's Awami League party, which identifies as largely secular. However, the recent wave of anarchy, looting and targeted attacks has shaken the community to its core. Recent reports from the Bangladesh Hindu Buddhist Christian Unity Council and Bangladesh Puja Ujjapan Parishad highlight a disturbing rise in violence against minorities with over 205 incidents reported across 52 districts. The caretaker government led by Muhammad Yunus is under increasing pressure to recognize and address this crisis as a critical human rights issue. Failure to act decisively could result in the further marginalization of Bangladesh's Hindu population threatening the nation's diversity and its identity as a secular state. Let's now turn our attention to the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, which has witnessed a steep rise in terror attacks in the last few months, orchestrated by Pakistan-backed terror outfits. Recently, intense clashes between Indian security forces and terrorists in Anantanag district of the Union Territory resulted in the deaths of two soldiers and a civilian. The violence continued in Jammu and Kashmir's Doda district, where Indian Army Captain Deepak Singh was killed while engaging terrorists. The series of attacks underscores a troubling trend. Pakistani terrorists, aided by local operatives, are intensifying their efforts to destabilize the region. A report. On August 10th, a deadly clash erupted between security forces and terrorists in Anantanag district, Jammu and Kashmir. The encounter was initiated after intelligence reports indicated terrorist presence in the area. Swiftly responding to the threat, security forces launched a cordon and search operation. As the search team approached the suspected hideout, the terrorists unleashed a barrage of gunfire. Tragically, two Indian Army soldiers and one local resident lost their lives in the ensuing firefight. The operation conducted in the Gagarmandu area intensified when security personnel spotted terrorist movements, leading to a fierce exchange of gunfire. This operation, 
سیکیورٹی فورسز کے جو دو اہل کاروں کو جو تھے وہ شدید طور سے جخمی ہو گئے تھے بعد میں دے اٹین مارٹر ڈم آلسو ایک اہل کار اور انجرڈ تھا جو کی ابھی سٹیبل ہے اور اسی وہاں پر ایک اور جو کی تفتیش کا موضوع بھی ہے وہاں پہ کچھ اور لوگ تھے جو کی اس گولیوں کے تبادلے میں اس کی زد میں آئے جس میں ایک جو سیویلین تھا وہ بھی شدید طور پہ جخمی ہو کے ہی سکم ٹو ہز انجریز In a separate incident, a gunfight broke out between security forces and terrorists in the Asar area of Jammu and Kashmir's Doda district. The encounter occurred in a dense forest during a cordon and search operation by a joint team aiming to track down terrorists hiding in the Shivgar Asar belt. This confrontation resulted in the loss of Indian Army Captain Deepak Singh, who sacrificed his life in the line of duty. However, the security forces managed to neutralize one terrorist and recover an M4 rifle, clothing and rucksacks from the scene. This encounter marks the sixth such attack in Doda's higher region since June 12th, which has resulted in the deaths of four soldiers, including Captain Singh. However, in joint operations, security forces and police have eliminated three foreign terrorists. These terrorists and all, ISI is bent upon sending them with the aid and full notice of the Pakistan government. Till the time we in, in India stop being reactive mode and take on a proactive mode, that is we take this fight down to Pakistan in its own territory, this will carry on. Till the time the cost of these infiltrations and these terrorists is not imposed on the Pakistan army, nothing will change. because Pakistan is hell-bent upon raising up the terrorism again in Jammu and Kashmir and also trying to ensure that this message goes across to the world that Jammu and Kashmir is not stable. Jammu and Kashmir, there is unrest over there. So we have to now change our tactics and ensure that whichever post, whichever area the terrorism, terrorists start infiltrating, that entire post should be eliminated so that the cost of that goes on to the Pakistan army and the Pakistan rangers then only Pakistan will stop sending these terrorists inside the territory. The security forces have now intensified search operations in the high-altitude areas of Doda, Katua and Udhampur districts as they hunt for terrorists suspected of infiltrating the region through dense forests aiming to revive militancy in Jammu. Pakistani terrorists have been infiltrating these areas with the help of local overground workers and are using well-concealed hideouts. The recent surge in attacks in Katwa, Doda and Riyasi mirrors the terror-stricken districts of Pulwama, Kulgam, Shopian and Anantanag in South Kashmir. This troubling pattern underscores Pakistan's deliberate and sinister efforts to extend its influence and terror activities deeper into Jammu. The global community must take note of Pakistan's role in perpetuating this violence and hold it accountable for its continued support of terrorism. It's been three years since the Taliban took over Kabul on August 15, 2021. The event changed the South Asian nation in many ways, with the most profound impact being experienced by the Afghan women. The dreams of a brighter future have been crushed with the regime systematically dismantling women's rights. Education, employment and basic freedoms have all been stripped away, turning the country into one of the most repressive places in the world. The anniversary serves as a stark reminder of the devastating impact of the Taliban's rule on half of the nation's population. We have a report. Afghanistan, a nation once filled with aspirations, has been plunged into darkness under the Taliban's rule. Since their return to power, the country has witnessed a severe erosion of women's rights, making it one of the most repressive places for women and girls in the world. In the three years 
since the Taliban regained control, Afghan women and girls have seen their fundamental rights systematically dismantled. The regime's policies have stripped them of education, employment opportunities, freedom of movement and political participation. Afghanistan has become the only country where girls are banned from continuing their education beyond the sixth grade, marking a tragic regression in women's rights. The Taliban's draconian measures extend far beyond education. Women are now restricted from many forms of employment, denied protection from gender-based violence, and face significant barriers to accessing health care. Even simple pleasures like playing sports or visiting parks have been taken away. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan, Richard Bennett, has condemned this reality as an institutionalized system of discrimination, segregation and exclusion of women and girls. I think it would be accurate to say that ever since the Taliban took over power, these years have seen a steady but inexorable marginalization of women in all fields, whether it is education, whether it is employment. If you remember, initially restrictions were put on education in view of the law and order situation. But once women were kept out, they were not allowed to come in at all. And what has happened is, slowly but surely, they have been kept out of all institutions of education. As for employment, it is clear that, you know, uh, they have this particular system, no women may be allowed to be, you know, uh, can, can be allowed outside unless they have, she has a chaperone. Now, initially, they allowed women to work with NGOs, etc. Now, even that right has been taken away. So, when it comes to employment, also, what women have seen is their continuous and steady exclusion from any avenue of employment whatsoever, whether it is private or public. The repression intensified in 2024 when the Taliban began detaining women and girls across Kabul and other provinces for what they termed bad hijab or failing to comply with the Taliban's strict dress code. Reports from the United Nations reveal that these detainees have been held incommunicado, subjected to physical violence and faced severe threats and intimidation. In March this year, the Taliban's supreme leader, Hibatullah Akhundzada, reaffirmed the group's commitment to enforcing their version of Sharia law, including the reintroduction of public flogging and stoning for so-called moral offences. According to Afghan Witness, a group monitoring human rights in the country, the Taliban carried out 417 public floggings and executions last year alone. The Taliban's rule has thus significantly curtailed human rights with women bearing the brunt of this oppression. In addition to intensified restrictions on women's and girls' rights, the Taliban have severely curtailed freedom of expression and the media and have detained and tortured protesters, critics and journalists. The fact is, the Taliban does not want a media which keeps on criticizing it and keeps preparing a ground for a situation that the Taliban can be overthrown. So to that extent, they want to control the narrative. So you cannot be over Taliban. At best, you may say certain policies are wrong, that uh, some aspects of governance are wrong, or that food aid has not received a particular village, or we could do with more infrastructure. This is the kind of non-controversial criticism that the Taliban basically want to push. But if anybody wants to say that this system cannot work, it is doomed to failure, then the Taliban will not take it kindly. And unfortunately, I think un unless a particular system of governance is able to 
allow criticism and let its policies by uh, corrected by constructive criticism it will not be able to function right now taliban is having a free run because internationally there is no appetite to start another civil war in afghanistan and try to change the taliban the taliban's harsh treatment of women has isolated afghanistan on the world stage most countries refuse to recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government and the United Nations has made it clear that recognition is off the table as long as bans on female education and employment remain in place. The international community's condemnation has been steadfast though the Taliban dismisses such criticism as an unwelcome foreign interference. As Afghanistan grapples with this authoritarian regime, the clash between the Taliban's oppressive rule and the global demand for human rights continues. The nation's future remains uncertain, caught in the tension between a brutal past and the hope for a more equitable future. Moving on. In a display of growing discontent, scores of women who are the backbone of many Pakistani households recently took to the streets of Karachi to protest against soaring inflation and unfair taxes. This demonstration highlights the deepening economic crisis that has crippled the lives of ordinary citizens in Pakistan. Let's take a closer look at the story. Hundreds of women primarily affiliated with the Jamaat Islami party recently staged a protest in Pakistan's bustling city of Karachi. The rally was a desperate cry against the skyrocketing inflation and the imposition of unfair taxes that have left countless families struggling to survive. These women, many of whom bear the responsibility of managing household finances, share harrowing accounts of their daily struggles. They painted a grim picture of an economy that has pushed people to the brink, with some even claiming that the government's policies are forcing them into destitution. I want to demand this from all of you. My only appeal from the government is that if this bill can't be done, then our parents, brothers, sisters, will have more employment in order to provide more employment. Because if one person has given more than 30,000 rupees and gives more than 30,000 rupees, then where will it come from? It will come to the point of pride, because there are three children who are dying from hunger, for gas, for making food, for making food, but there are no lack of food. So one person will come from where will it come from? कहाँ से पूरा करेगा ये हमारी आवाम की जान ले रहे हैं कभी महंगाई से तो लोग खुदकुशियाँ कर रहे हैं तंगा आके मजबूर होके ये जालिम हैं इनको इनको कोई हक ही नहीं है कि ये हुक्मरानी करें ये लुटेरे हैं इन्होंने हमारे मुल्क को लूट लिया पूरा बेच दिया Pakistan is currently grappling with record high inflation that has deeply affected essential commodities and services, eroding the purchasing power of ordinary citizens. This has left many struggling to meet even their most basic needs. The government's imposition of increased taxes on energy bills and essential goods has only worsened the situation. In a single year, power prices were raised by 26% and a further 20% increase was imposed in mid-July. These measures have sparked outage among the public, particularly among those who already find it difficult to make ends meet. तालबा सिर्फ उनसे ये डिमांड सिर्फ उनसे ये है कि इन बिलों को कम किया जाए, महंगाई को कम किया जाए और जो बेवजह के टैक्सेस लगकर बिलों में आते हैं उन्हें कम किया जाए। the situation has been exacerbated by Pakistan's recent 7 billion US dollar loan deal with the International Monetary Fund, which includes tough conditions such as higher taxes on electricity prices. This has caused widespread concern among the poor and middle class populations who fear further inflation and additional financial burdens. 
as families are forced to cut back on meals and stretch their budgets to the breaking point, the human cost of this economic turmoil is becoming painfully evident. The lack of government action and accountability is pushing Pakistan's middle class to the brink with no clear relief in sight. The voices of these protesting women serve as a stark reminder of the growing desperation and frustration among the Pakistani public who are demanding urgent solutions to an escalating crisis. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.